So the topic of discussion in today's lecture is going to be the Fanconi syndrome. So remember an important point here that the Fanconi syndrome is actually categorized under type 2 renal tubular acidosis. So let me write first what exactly is the renal tubular acidosis. And Fanconi is categorized under type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Right? Yeah. So mainly in the type 2 renal tubular acidosis, there will be a problem of the proximal convoluted tubule to reabsorb bicarbonate. So bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule is going to be defective. And that is called as type 2 renal tubular acidosis. And here you should not be confused with the Fanconi syndrome with the Fanconi's anemia because Fanconi's anemia is actually a hereditary autosomal recessive disorder due to DNA cross-link repair defect resulting in the bone marrow failure. So especially in this Fanconi syndrome, it is the complete problem or a complete inactivation of the proximal convoluted tubule. In general terminology, we can say that PCT is not working. Completely it is not working. So further, if we talk about the renal tubular acidosis type 2, it is further categorized under two variants. Isolated bicarbonate reabsorption deficiency as well as Fanconi syndrome. So in the isolated bicarbonate reabsorption deficiency, only bicarbonate reabsorption is defective. But whereas in the Fanconi syndrome, along with the bicarbonate, amino acids, glucose, phosphate, all are excreted rather than reabsorbed. Remember this point carefully. In isolated bicarbonate reabsorption defect is one variant of renal tubular acidosis type 2. But in Fanconi syndrome, I want to repeat the sentence precisely once again. In Fanconi syndrome, along with the bicarbonate reabsorption, whatever is getting reabsorbed in the PCT is going to be excreted in the urine. So for this, you should have a profound knowledge of the physiology of the proximal convoluted tubule to understand this topic. So we know that PCT is a tubule which is responsible for the maximum absorption of the solutes. It absorbs almost 67% of the sodium and water and reabsorbs potassium, chlorine and also reabsorbs phosphate and 100% of the glucose as well as amino acids are absorbed in the PCT. This is what is the physiology of the PCT, what we should know to understand this concept. And I already mentioned about uh, the difference between the Fanconi syndrome as well as the Fanconi's anemia, right? What is the Fanconi's anemia? It has nothing to do with the syndrome, guys. Fanconi's anemia is completely different. Even though both are autosomal recessive, this Fanconi's anemia is a hereditary autosomal recessive disorder due to the DNA cross-link repair defect resulting in the bone marrow failure. So, whenever we talk about this Fanconi syndrome, it is also very important for us to differentiate between this Fanconi syndrome as well as and other renal tubular defects. What are the other renal tubular defects? What we know? Barter's, Jutelman, Liddell's. So all these are also categorized under renal tubular defects, but the defect is only associated with a particular type of transporter. Remember, all these are the defects associated with a particular defect in the transport system. Whereas in the Fanconi syndrome, it is not a defect of a specific transporter, but 
it is the global defect of the PCT. So the point I want to write here in the Fanconi syndrome is Fanconi syndrome. So the point what we have to remember here it is the global defect of PCT. So you have to remember this point. It is the global defect of the proximal convoluted tubule. So what do you mean by the global defect of the PCT? We know that the PCT is not working completely. Remember this point in the Fanconi syndrome. So now let us appreciate regarding what are the various causes. What are the various causes of the Fanconi syndrome? So remember one important point here guys. So whatever I am writing here, concentrate on those points to remember. Other than whatever I am writing, they are the points related to the concepts to remember as well as understand the topic precisely. And whatever I'm writing here, these are the points you have to know must and sure for your exams. Okay. Yeah. So now we are talking about the causes of the Fanconi syndrome. So first let us write about the hereditary causes. Let us concentrate on these points. Hereditary. Hereditary causes. In the hereditary causes, the most common cause of Fanconi syndrome in terms of hereditary cause in the children will be cystinosis. So hereditary causes will be cystinosis. Other than cystinosis, there are other conditions like Wilson's. There are other conditions like Wilson's and tyrosinemia. Tyrosinemia and type 1 glycogen storage disease and also galactosemia galactosemia dent disease so all these are the hereditary causes of the fanconies so other than the hereditary we also have acquired causes like ischemia right acquired causes like ischemia so other than ischemia other causes can be multiple myeloma multiple myeloma because in the multiple myeloma the light chains are getting reabsorbed by the pct responsible for the complete damage of the pct cells and in the acquired causes only the drugs drugs play a vast major role in the development of the Fanconis. Most commonly the expired, expired tetracyclines, expired tetracyclines and tenofovir, antiviral drug tenofovir, iphosphamide, iphosphamide and cisplatin. Iphosphamide and cisplatin. So, what are the drugs? Let's repeat this point once again. Expired tetracyclines, tenofovir, iphosphamide, and cisplatin. So, these are the drugs which are responsible for the development of Fanconi syndrome. Other than this, there are the conditions also which can cause the Fanconi, the conditions like uh, amyloidosis. The conditions like uh, amyloidosis and other causative factors like heavy metal poisoning, heavy metals, heavy metals. So in the heavy metals we have cadmium, lead, cadmium, lead as well as mercury. 
So out of all the three, most commonly it is because of the cadmium toxicity. Whenever you have options in the MCQ, if you have both cadmium as well as lead, your answer of choice should be cadmium. Right? And there are like other conditions also like uh, other clinical scenarios which can develop the fanconies like renal transplantation. I'm not going to write here because they are less common causes or the vitamin D deficiency as well as another important one will be paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. P and H. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So and the Jochgren syndrome. Jochgren syndrome. Remember this point? Jochgren syndrome. And a point we need to note here that this Jochgren syndrome more commonly cause distal renal tubular acidosis rather than proximal, but it can also cause the proximal renal tubular acidosis that is Fanconi's. So this is the list what we need to appreciate regarding various causes of the Fanconi's. Hereditary causes including cystinosis, Wilson's tyrosinemia, type 1 glycogen storage disease, galactosemia as well as dent disease, and ischemia, multiple myeloma, the drugs like uh, expired tetracyclines, tenofovir, iphosphamide, cisplatin, and the conditions like amyloidosis and heavy metal toxicity like cadmium, lead and mercury, the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and the Jogren syndrome. Remember, all these are considered to be the causes of the Fanconi syndrome, right? Now, now let us appreciate regarding the clinical presentation, clinical presentation of the case. Okay, let us concentrate on the clinical presentation. So, remember that the presentation of the patients with the Fanconi syndrome is often associated with the deficiency of the compounds which are excreted, which means PCT actually need to reabsorb glucose, amino acids, phosphate, chlorine, bicarbonate, sodium and water. If all these are not reabsorbed, there will be a clinical manifestations associated with these guys, right? So most often because of the large amount of the sodium and water is going to be excreted. The most important clinical feature what we need to appreciate here is polyuria. Right? Polyuria. Remember this point. This polyuria causes polydipsia. Right? Polydipsia. And which in turn causes hypovolemia. Right, polyuria, which leads to polydipsia and hypovolemia. So, whenever we precisely talk about this polyuria, what exactly is the polyuria? Polyuria is nothing but the production of abnormally large amount of urine. And whenever we want to define quantitatively, it is defined as greater than 3 liters per day greater than 3 liters of urine per day that is in 24 hours. So because of this polyuria what is happening the patient is experiencing polydipsia. So what is the polydipsia guys? Polydipsia is a condition which is associated with excessive thirst. Associated with excessive thirst. Why there is excessive thirst? There is a loss of sodium loss of water. So because of loss of sodium and water, ECF volume is going to be depleted. Whenever body water concentration and the ECF volume is decreased, your hypothalamus is going to sense and it is going to stimulate the thirst center and you will feel excessive thirst. So that is the condition called as polydipsia, a condition of excessive thirst that can be caused by organic dehydration hypovolemia and not only in this condition this polydipsia can also be seen in other conditions like hyperglycemia diabetes insipidus or non-organic conditions like psychogenic polydipsia so in all these conditions polydipsia can be seen so because of the polydipsia 
and the patient feel thirst and he try to take water to restore whatever the ECF volume which is lost right yeah now another important clinical scenario will be hypophosphatemic rickets so what is happening guys here there will be excretion excretion of phosphate right so there will be excretion of phosphate so because of the excretion of the phosphate what is happening guys phosphate concentration in the blood is decreased because of the excretion of the phosphate the phosphate concentration in the blood decreases that leads to a condition called as hypophosphatemic rickets right so i will write hypophosphatemic rickets hypophosphatemic rickets so why are we calling it as rickets rickets actually seen in vitamin d deficiency in the children remember phosphate is also equally important for the formation and growth of the bones because this phosphate is also pretty important for the formation of a bone matrix called as hydroxyapatite so not only just calcium is important for the density of the bones phosphate is also equally important to maintain the density of the bones so especially in the children if the phosphate is excreted just calcium alone cannot form the bones there's a reason bone formation will be defective right and bones will be thinner the density of the bones is going to be decreased there's a reason we are calling it as a condition called as hypophosphatemic rickets in the children and what we will appreciate is osteomalacia in adults right what you will appreciate is osteomalacia in adults because in the adults because the phosphate is not there calcium also cannot just work alone and the bone formation cannot be active and in the adults you know osteoclast activity also will be there that leads to osteomalacia in adults due to the loss of the phosphate so now we know what is the consequence of hypophosphatemia because of hyperphosphate urea because the phosphate is going to be excreted in the urine and in children whenever we speak especially in the children if the fanconi syndrome is developed because of the hereditary causes the most common clinical finding in the children will be growth failure so what we will see in the children in the children what is the most common clinical presentation more commonly we will see growth failure so why do you think there's a growth failure guys there are multiple mechanisms we can explain in detail regarding to this growth failure so growing bones require calcium yes we know at the same time growing bones also require phosphate yes we know that also so when this phosphate is not there when it is excreted in the urine do you think the calcium can form the bones alone so if it cannot then what will happen the growth of the skeletal system cannot be proper as per the age so there will be a stunted growth so there will be only stunted growth but we are not seeing any intellectual disability until or unless the acidosis is very very severe but remember in fanconi syndrome the acidosis is not very severe it is in milder form so we are not discussing anything regarding the mental retardation or intellectual disability in general case scenario but there will be a growth failure what we call it as a stunted growth and also there will be episodes of hypovolemia in these children because of the polyuria caused by impaired concentrating ability of the renal tubules right so even in these patients stunted growth can be seen along with the stunted growth what we can see is the polyuria right so these are the two most important clinical manifestations what we will appreciate in the children so whenever we are explaining this topic in much more detail regarding the poor growth or the stunted growth mainly because of uh, hypophosphatemia so the persistent acidosis not just hypophosphatemia the persistent acidosis chronic hypokalemia rickets and volume depletion all responsible for the growth failure 
let us discuss one by one in detail. So let's give some kind of a definition. So why this acidosis is responsible for the development of growth failure. So whenever there is acidosis, what is happening to the blood pH? It is the blood pH is going to be decreased when compared to that of the normal, which is acidosis. If you remember the biochemistry chapter called as enzymes, where you have the factors affecting enzyme activity regarding that uh, all the enzymes are active at a particular pH called as neutral pH or the body pH and at a particular temperature, we studied about this. So whenever the pH is decreased, that is acidosis, the enzymes are not going to work properly. If the enzymes are not going to work properly, if the metabolism is not supporting the child to grow, so there will be a stunted growth, right? So at the same time, if there's a chronic hypokalemia, if the potassium is going to be excreted in the urine, there will be a muscle wasting because muscles require potassium. We know this. So not only that muscles cannot grow, at the same time, there's a constipation and muscle weakness also can be seen, which is caused by a significant hypokalemia. So whenever we are calling it as a significant hypokalemia, the serum potassium concentration will be less than 3 milli equivalent per liter. So we will also see hypokalemia in this patient's here. Right? Hypokalemia. Because of this hypokalemia, there will be a muscle weakness also, what we can appreciate in these patients, right? So growth failure will be there, polyuria will be there, polydipsia will be there, volume depletion will be there, and there will be prolonged hypokalemia that leads to muscle weakness. And also what we can appreciate in the patients will be nephrocalcinosis. Nephrocalcinosis. So instead of using the word called as nephrolithiasis, it is better to use the word called as nephrocalcinosis. So why? Because the stones are not quite larger. The stones are not formed in the nephrons. They are actually formed in the renal calluses. But why are we using a word called as nephrocalcinosis here? It is very important to know. So what is the normal urinary pH? Generally, if everything is working absolutely fine, if the patient is not having uh, any type of Fanconi syndrome or anything, then automatically we can say that the pH, whatever, so the next clinical manifestation, what we need to appreciate here is nephrocalcinosis. So remember this point. So we will be talking about nephrocalcinosis. So here it is very, very important for you to concentrate on the concept. So what is the normal urine pH? I'm not talking about the range. Because whenever we talk about the range, we call it as 4.5 to 7.5. And some authors say that 4.5 to 8, right? But in general, the urine is acidic or basic. Tell me that point. It is acidic. Normally, the urine pH will be less than 6. Yes, absolutely true. Which means in this particular acidic pH, whatever may be the calcium which is traveling along the tubules, it is not going to precipitate and they do not form stones. In general, whenever the urinary pH is less than 5, we often call it as acidic. I am not talking about the normal ranges. So generally the urine itself is acidic. But when we want to talk about a condition, below 5 is called as more acidic urine. And whenever the pH of the urine is above 8, is called as alkaline urine. But as I mentioned that the urinary pH will be, in normal conditions, it will be 6. So in such conditions, tell me what happens if the urinary pH is going to be 6.5, 7, 7.5. So whenever I talk about 6.5, 6.2, 6.3, it is greater than 6, but less than 7. It is still acidic, but more alkaline compared to that of the normal urinary pH that is called as 6. Why we are talking this point? Because this condition called as nephrocalcinosis, that is calcium stones, 
cannot be formed in all the conditions calcium stones are formed because calcium tends to precipitate in the alkaline solution which means in vast majority of the cases in the fanconies because of the distal convoluted tubule as well as the, the collecting duct system the hydrogen ion secretion will be normal and the urinary ph will be generally between 4.5 or 5 in such conditions the calcium stones do not precipitate and nephrocalcinosis will not develop but if there is a too much load of the bicarbonate reaching the dct as well as the collecting ducts but less amount of the hydrogen ions which are secreted into the lumen in such conditions because of the pretty higher concentration of bicarbonate what will be the ph of the urine is higher which means maybe greater than 5 greater than 6 greater than 6.5 or greater than 7 as the urine becomes more alkaline in the collecting duct area in such conditions the calcium stones are formed because a golden rule what we need to remember is calcium tends to precipitate in the alkaline solution so even though i'm mentioning about the nephrocalcinosis here so this explanation is very very important for you to note nephrocalcinosis depends on the ph of the urine if it is more alkaline nephrocalcinosis can be formed and if it is less alkaline which means if it is acidic nephrocalcinosis cannot be seen that is the reason some authors don't even mention about the nephrocalcinosis word in the fanconi syndrome but it is very important to know if calcium stones are formed and these calcium stones that is nephrocalcinosis is seen bilaterally remember this point bilaterally right nephrocalcinosis is seen bilaterally and these calcium stones are formed because they are getting precipitated in the alkaline solution and bilaterally so these are the points always you need to remember a very important point what you need to remember over here is calcium stones are formed only if the ph of the urine is more alkaline but not acidic yeah so we discussed about the nephrocalcinosis now it is important to concentrate few points regarding acidosis so whenever we are talking about acidosis that is renal tubular acidosis it is the acidosis of the body in the blood which is metabolic acidosis why there is metabolic acidosis because of loss of bicarbonate in the urine and there will be increased in the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood a very simple point to remember that this is how it causes acidosis and even though the dct or the collecting ducts are working properly the hydrogen ion secretion is normal at these places but there is a too much bicarbonate load which is reaching the collecting ducts and the hydrogen ion secretion at that location cannot compensate the bicarbonate loss even though the dct as well as the even though the dct as well as the collecting ducts are working normally they will secrete normal amount of hydrogen ions it may compensate a little bit of acid base balance but not more there's a reason acidification of the urine at this location is normal but the bicarbonate load is pretty pretty high remember this point so there's a reason we say that defect in the reabsorption of the bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule responsible for the development of acidosis but as in all the forms of the proximal renal tubular acidosis remember this point very clearly that the threshold of the bicarbonate is low but the distal acidification is normal you have to note this point distal acidification is normal in the tubules so because of this the urinary ph can be lowered appropriately to 4.5 to 5 that's the reason i said in fanconi syndrome some authors say that the ph will be 7 all the time no it is not true because the distal acidification is normal the ph will be 4.5 to 5 it is still acidic that's the reason nephrocalcinosis cannot be seen it can be seen only if the bicarbonate load is very high 
and if the hydrogen ion secretion is normal or lower in such conditions whenever the pH goes beyond 6, 6.5 or 7 precipitation of the calcium is responsible for the development of the calcium stones remember this point okay but in advanced cases of renal disease in long-standing cases of fancuries what will happen the distal acidification mechanism is also impaired when the distal acidification mechanism is also impaired in such condition there will be alkaline urine in such condition at any cost the nephrocalcinosis can be formed right this is a valid statement but whatever it may be a genesis appears to be normal also in this condition so this is what you need to know regarding the clinical presentation of the Fanconi syndrome so what are all the points we have discussed about uh, the clinical manifestations guys we discussed about uh, polyuria polydipsia hypovolemia and uh, we said that there will be excretion of the urine greater than 3 liters per day and also the patient is going to excrete large amount of phosphate that leads to hypophosphatemic rickets what we have discussed and um, in adults what we can appreciate is the osteomalacia and there will be a growth failure in the children and also in the children we can also see the polyuria so growth failure as well as polyuria are considered to be the most important manifestations and as well as the children as well as in the adults we will see hypokalemia this hypokalemia for longer periods of time responsible for the muscle weakness and there will be nephrocalcinosis nephrocalcinosis can be seen only if the urinary ph is alkaline greater than six or seven or something else it is not seen in acidic urine right this is the clinical presentation now after clinical presentation let us concentrate on uh, the diagnosis here right diagnosis so in the diagnosis what we will see is hyperchloremic hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis but what will be the anion gap normal normal anion so normal anion gap, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, what we are going to appreciate in the serum. Very important for diagnosis point of view. As well as in the serum, what we can also appreciate will be hypokalemia. Right? hypokalemia because of too much loss of potassium in the urine this is what is responsible for the development of muscle weakness for the prolonged time and an important point what we need to remember here is what is the treatment we will give for the fanconi generally we will give alkaline therapy right because why we are giving alkaline therapy because it is acidosis so remember this point very carefully that this hypokalemia worsens with alkaline therapy this worsens versions with alkaline therapy okay hypokalemia will be a milder the hypokalemia may become severe with the alkaline therapy so the degree of hypokalemia is usually milder in this form when compared to that of type 1 renal tubular acidosis because in the type 1 renal tubular acidosis it is very very severe but in this condition it is milder form but however this hypokalemia as i already mentioned worsens whenever you are going to initiate the treatment with alkali that is alkaline therapy so severe hypokalemia may also be seen in the case of fanconi syndrome when you initiate the alkaline therapy that is the reason it is very important for you to have a check regarding the potassium concentrations so other than these two what are the other conditions you are going to appreciate here there will be hypouricemia right hypouricemia can be seen and there will be hypophosphatemia because phosphate concentrations are low in the blood so decrease in the phosphate concentrations in the blood so that leads to hypophosphatemia so other than this what are the things we can see glucose urea 
and we will see amino acids which are going into the urine so amino acid urea right so decreased phosphate concentration in the blood hypophosphatemia so there will be glucose urea glucose is going to go into the blood glucose is going to go into the urine and there will be amino acid urea amino acid are going to be excreted in the urine right now so what will be the urinary ph guys urinary ph i told you that distal acidification is normal and i also mentioned that it will be between 4.5 to 5 which means can we say less than 5.5 yes less than 5.5 in such condition what do you think nephrocalcinosis is formed no so remember no so urine ph is less than 5.5 but remember a point that urine ph may be greater than 5.5 before acidosis sets in before acidosis sets in it may be greater than 5.5 but in general as a diagnostic point of view you have to remember that the urinary ph will be less than 5.5 or between 4.5 to 5 right and what we will appreciate here as a diagnosis point of view also is we will perform the bicarbonate infusion test bicarbonate infusion test remember this point bicarbonate infusion test so whenever you infuse bicarbonate what will happen to the urinary ph anyway the pct is not working so there will be too much load of bicarbonate at the pct so along with the normal bicarbonate this infused bicarbonate also is going to go into the urine that is towards the collecting duct so in such conditions the urine ph rises above 7.5 whenever you give the bicarbonate infusion test what will happen urinary ph will be above 7.5 and the fractional excretion of the bicarbonate is greater than 15 percent following iv sodium chloride administration that is what we need to remember about the bicarbonate infusion test but for examination point of view just remember that we are giving bicarbonate infusion test right now i told you a very important and valid point that the moment you initiate alkaline therapy what will happen the hypokalemia is going to worsen right in such condition what you should do you have to give the supplemental potassium so supplemental potassium should be given during the infusion because sodium chloride may induce hypokalemia also this is also a very valid point you need to remember and there will be a negative urine anion gap all of us we know regarding the diagnosis so all these are the diagnostic points we need to appreciate regarding the Fanconi syndrome now let us concentrate on important points the final tab called as treatment so how you are going to treat this condition treatment so let us concentrate on the valid points here remember the clinicians initially prescribe 10 to 15 milli equivalents per kg per day of alkali so you have to concentrate this point 10 to 15 milli equivalent 10 to 15 milli equivalent per kg per day 10 to 15 milli equivalent per kg per day of alkali that is also be given in divided doses can be given in divided doses and in the patients with proximal renal tubular acidosis mainly to overcome the urinary bicarbonate losses and also to raise the serum levels the bicarbonate urea generated by the alkali therapy also increases the urinary potassium losses because of increased sodium bicarbonate and water delivery to the distal tubule stimulates the potassium secretion that is the reason I am repeating this sentence again and again that there will be severe hypokalemia whenever you are going to initiate this treatment. So as a result an empirically determined fraction of the alkali replacement must be given as a potassium salt. So you have to administer the potassium salt to overcome the potassium losses whenever you are initiating this alkali therapy so what we will give it is not just alkali therapy right so alkali 
alkali plus what you will give potassium citrate potassium citrate alkali with potassium citrate what you will give why are we giving potassium citrate to overcome the potassium losses because of the alkaline therapy and this potassium citrate is extremely important you should not forget this point is mainly required in order to correct the hypokalemia that occurs in the initiation of alkali therapy so we mentioned about 10 to 15 milli equivalents per kg per day should be given in divided doses and we said that the treatment should be in combination with the alkali therapy plus the potassium citrate and also what type of diuretics are recommended in this condition tell me thiazide diuretics what are the diuretics we will give thiazide diuretics so thiazide diuretics if alkali are not tolerated or effective so that is the reason we can say these are used as second line so these are used as the second line so thiazide diuretics are administrated if alkali are not well tolerated or alkaline therapy is not tolerated well or if it is not effective we will give thiazide diuretics this thiazide diuretics result in volume depletion as well as they enhance bicarbonate reabsorption so this is what we need to know about the treatment of the Fanconi syndrome so by this we completed an important topic a variant of a type 2 renal tubular acidosis called as the Fanconi syndrome